This is so exciting, standing room only. Uh, so uh, without any further rumbling, I'm going to turn it over to Virginia. And um, if you have any questions, for Virginia. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm uh, totally overwhelmed by uh, the people who've come this afternoon. And I want to say a special thanks to my friends who've come from Blue Sky and from the Emporia State University School of Library and Information Management, Oregon cohort. Um, and let's see, members of my family, my old friends. And I especially want to give a shout out to Jeff Becker of Becker Productions, who's making a video of my presentation. And I hope you'll bear with me. I have a sheaf of notes here. Uh, you know, there's that option in PowerPoint to print your notes pages, so I did. And I don't want to look at them too much. I want to look at you, and I want to look at the screen. But there's some juicy stuff in here, and I hope you don't mind if I refer to them a little bit. So um, oh, could we see a slide? <laughs> Can we see this first slide? <laughs> This is your big test, Jim. Just said forward, backward, oh, 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 okay. Um, okay, so my opening remarks. All art aspires to the condition of music. All photographs aspire to be memorable. That's Susan Sontag. Mine is all photographers aspire to publish a book. <laughs> and why is that? Because photo loves book. I used to characterize my research method as being like throwing a rock into a pond and following the ripples out. But I researched this talk online because that's where people communicate now. And a lot of it is through the web 2.0 social media. Instead of a pond, I found myself a wash in an ocean. I made several false starts trying to build a narrative, which I'm always trying to do. And believe me, I start with cave painting usually. But it was like building on wet sand. So luckily I'm a knitter, and I hit on the me metaphor of winding a ball of yarn out of a tangled mess. And so I'm going to pull this string through the state of photo books today. And um, you know, actually, this is supposed to be cyan yellow, I mean cyan, magenta, yellow, black. And actually, that's what it does look like on the monitor, the, the four, four color inks. But on the screen, it's this cyan has become this. And it's interesting because cyan is used in a lot of the websites now, you know, to give you that pop of, uh, yes, this is all about printing photographs. So it's going to look a little strange. Can I have the next one, please, Jim? Thank you, Jim. <laughs> OK, so um, I'd like to start at Blue Sky, uh, which I'm sure all of you folks know, some of you better than everybody else. And the next one, please. Where I've been working in the library as a volunteer, putting the library in order. And that's the photo of the library on the website. And that photo was taken before I began. And you see all those empty sections there along the bottom? Those are now filled with books. So in 15 months, I would say we've added about 250 books. And they're all donations. And we have the next one, please. So that's more like what it looks like now. You can see the little tags I've added trying to um, devise some categories. And uh, some of the books come through the exhibitions committee. The exhibition committee uh, looks at photo books from time to time as part of the review process. And some of those books go into the library as well. At Blue Sky, I'm adding shelf marks of my own invention um, and putting all the records onto what's called library thing. If anybody hasn't seen library thing yet, it's really worth looking at. It's kind of it's social media for book lovers, for wannabe librarians or <laughs> potential librarians like me. And my username is photobuff. Two F's O T O B U F F. And I have a public profile. So you can see the books that are in my home library and you can see everything that I've added for Blue Sky and it comes to a total of about fifteen hundred books so far. I'm not anywhere near being finished. And I use what I call a Dewey Newhall system, which is a variant of my own system of my own devising uh, on the system that was used in the MoMA photography department, begun by Beaumont Newhall, 
who was also, of course, the first librarian of MoMA and subsequently the first head of the Department of Photography. The system was still in use when I was, at the, when I was study center supervisor in the photography department in the mid-1990s. So why shelve books in a museum photography department? I'm sure you all know the answer, because photo loves book. <laughs> and the next one, please. So a few weeks ago, I had a very pleasant chat in the Blue Sky Library with the photographer Matt Ike, whom uh, some of you may remember from when he was an intern, I believe, at the Oregonian. And uh, Blue Sky showed his series, Carry Me, Ohio, during the month of February. So I decided to start with Matt and to look up his book, Carry Me, Ohio, on Blurb, just to start that ball of yarn. Um, this is the blurb.com homepage. It's clean, fresh, user-friendly, not a lot of text, and it's clearly it's aimed at people who are visually oriented. And um, <clears throat> Blurb is really smart. It's plugged right into this recessionista DIY movement of the moment, and it's combined with digital technology and social media. It's a recipe that just really works. Have the next one. So here's Matt Ike's uh, book, uh, Carry Me, Ohio. As you can see, you can preview the entire book. You can see um, JPEGs or thumbnails of the entire book. Uh, it's easy to search for and find the page. And uh, he has a couple of other books. And one, one is about Baptist Town, Mississippi, and one is a wedding book. So you can see um, kind of a range in his uh, books. Um, the price that he has here is pretty high, $84.74, and it seems kind of arbitrary, and that's the print-on-demand price. And it's so high because there's no economy of scale. There's no, you know, uh, the price does not go down the number of books that are printed um, if, because they're printed on demand, only one at a time or maybe five at a time. Um, I think you can get a discount if you're ordering 5 or 10 or 15 or 20, but it's not like a mass uh, market printing where um, it would come down closer to being affordable. Um, if the photographer wants to uh, provide a preview, he has to attach a price. And so that may be one reason why Matt, Matt has posted that price. Um, you can see that there's um, Facebook, email, Twitter, Facebook like, room for comments. And so the blurb site makes it very easy for word of mouth about a book uh, to be spread. Be the first of your friends to like this. So then there's the comments below. Can I have the next one, please? And I was reading through these. And uh, you have to be a Blurb member in order to publish in the comments. And I started to notice that it says, I thought this was a winner, and thinking this should be a winner. Out of all the 2010 PBN, that's Photography Book Now winners, this book speaks to me the most. Every single image tells a story. Your book should have been number one for sure. <coughs> And somebody else says, this should definitely have won first place. And I'm thinking, wow, those are, you know, really great. That's, you know, some great fans there. Yeah, so, the photographer has really good friends. You know. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all, we, we need those too. Um, the next one. So going back to the Photography Book Now competition, uh, it, it's ended and the 2010 winners have been posted. Um, the grand prize winner that Matt Ike should have gotten uh, was Last Call by Judith Steineken, which is about um, is it Tempelhof Airport in Berlin. And if we go to the next one, please. So I found uh, Matt did win, and of course he won People's Choice. And uh, here's, uh, he, in the editorial category, Matt Ike, Fine Art category, Portfolio category, and so I was then paging through um, the other blurb winners and other categories. The next one. 
and found this honorable mention in the editorial category, My Brother's War by Jessica Hines and Elizabeth Avedon. And I thought, now that's a familiar name, Avedon. And I decided to pursue that. Now, Elizabeth Avedon is a book designer. I don't know how many of you have come across her name. Okay, the next one, please. Um, this is her homepage. She designed several books for her former father-in-law, the late Richard Avedon. This is the cover of Avedon Photographs, 1947 to 77. On her blog, which I recommend, in late 2009, Avedon wrote, I'm designing a book for a philanthropic organization as a beautiful gift to give away to their donors. This will be my first foray into the world of print-on-demand publishing. I've decided on using Blurb. And believe me, when somebody who has such long experience, you know, really 40 years plus, in um, photo book publishing decides to go into print on demand publishing and chooses blurb, that's a very high endorsement. So, can have the next one please? And uh, she blogs a lot and it's all interesting. Later in the same blog entry she continues, I was lamenting the loss of an actual physical book dummy until I had posted my original layouts for portraits. I started to wistfully describe what was involved in creating a mechanically correct book dummy and became overwhelmed with how difficult and time consuming it sounded and the text became un unimaginably long. So after the exhausting description, I promised never to yell at Quark for crashing my computer again. However, Annoying. Losing a couple of hours' work is nothing compared to just waiting around for a week for the first sale of galleys from the typesetter and photostats, and then she puts in parentheses, look it up, to arrive. <laughs> in an interview, Elizabeth Avedon tells the story of how, why she put together this messy dummy. At the time, she was a junior member of the uh, Avedon uh, studio team straight out of art school. Her mentor was the legendary book designer Marvin Israel, who designed, among others, the Diane Arbus monograph for Aperture. Jackie Onassis was invited to come over and look at the dummy to see if she'd get permission to use an Avedon portrait. Uh, but watching, Elizabeth could see that there was just too much material to go over that Jackie, probably in the most polite way possible, started to glaze over and didn't give permission. <laughs> so, and I think this is really gutsy. Uh, Elizabeth Avedon redid the dummy with paper clips and scotch tape. You can see here that she turned over the photo on the page opposite the portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. So I have the next one, please. Jim, oh, here we go. And this is the published version. Losing the image on the opposite page emphasizes the isolation of this odd pair of eccentrics. And of course, the dummy is a collectible artifact of which she's very proud. Next one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also from Elizabeth Avedon's blog from uh, February 2010, Jessica Hines approached me to design a portfolio to best showcase her photo essay, My Brother's War. This was to be a sort of book dummy, in quotes, to show potential publishers her intention behind her project in which she attempts to gain a better understanding of what happened to her brother Gary when he was a soldier in the Vietnam War. Drafted, he served two years and returned home a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder. Ten years later, he took his own life. She continues describing this project and concludes, a note about Blurb. While Blurb is an excellent showcase for your work and self-publishing your books, to be able to preview, and then she um, uh, explains why you have to preview, uh, you have to post the Price, we originally posted the entire project for the benefit of inquiring publishers overseas, and we've had such great feedback. So even for somebody who's uh, you know, been working in, shall we say, the traditional publishing business for a long time, the new print-on-demand services have opened doors to new opportunities. And next, please. Book Power was the very apt title of an exhibition here at 23 Sandy. And uh, this is Jim Lamison's uh, contribution to the exhibition, I Wouldn't Wish War on My Worst Enemy. 
Jim pulled these photographs and texts by veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, many of whom are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder in some form. From the mass of material he has gathered working with individuals and veterans groups for the past several years. And um, that, of course, is his project, Exit Wounds, Soldier Stories. And looking at the Jessica Hines uh, project, of course, reminded me of Jim's project. And here's, you know, I'm still pulling that string. I worked with Jim on this project for nine months uh, in 2009, 2010, and I assisted him by transcribing interviews. And I know that these aren't just stories, they're really testaments. The next one, please. The, um, a copy of I Wouldn't Wish War on My Worst Enemy was acquired from the Book Power Exhibition for the Reed College Artist Books Collection from which in turn it was selected for the Museum of Contemporary Crafts exhibition which just ended object focus, the book. And um, I have a little information here that explains about uh, that exhibition um, and explains that instead of publishing the catalog, they made it their guidebook, they made it available as a PDF for download. So. <clears throat> Here's an exhibition about books for which the guidebook or catalog is available as a PDF download for free. Next one, please. This is the first page of the PDF guidebook. And even though it's a PDF, the elegant typography tells you that this is really a book and it just begs to be printed. Next one, please. This is the entry for I Wouldn't Wish War on My Worst Enemy. And the next one, please. This is uh, Jim Lamison's website, the first page. Uh, this is one of his uh, photographs from um, the Exit Wounds project. Next one. And uh, Jim's blog uh, for Exit Wounds. So as part of that uh, project I was working on with Jim, or we're actually, he's still working on it and I'm going to return to it hopefully soon. Uh, in October, uh, Jim and I attended a veterans book project, which I'm going to try from now on to call the VBP, but I may get that all kind of mixed up here. Veterans Book Project Workshop at Fieldwork, which is a downtown storefront space set up by Portland State's MFA program in art and social practice. Fieldwork's mission is to be a site for interaction and collaboration with multiple publics. It's a very simple and spare space with white walls, and it almost feels as if you could write on that space, not just write in that space. Next one, please. As it says on the first page, uh, the website's first page, the Veterans Book Project is a project by Monica Haller. It's a project to generate books that uh, was itself generated by a book as explained in the About section. The Veterans Book Project, this is the explanation, is a library of books authored collaboratively by artist Monica Haller and dozens of people who've been affected by and have archives of the current American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Riley in his story, which is um, Monica's book, sets the framework for this project. Riley and His Story, published by One Star Press in 2009, was authored by Halley and, Haller sorry, and veteran Riley Charbonneau from the hundreds of digital images Charbonneau shot while deployed in Iraq as a nurse at Abu Ghraib prison. Riley and His Story came out of a four-year open-ended collaboration and established the framework for the Veterans Book Project. Um, I note that Monica Haller is identified as a quote-unquote artist who works collaboratively to quote unquote author these books with the workshop participants. The books are more than art objects, she tells us. They are quote unquote objects for deployment. This is book power taken literally. Art is definitely to the forefront of this project. Heller raised the funds primarily from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the McKnight Foundation, and the Minnesota State Arts Board. So it's also an artist's book project. 
The next one, please. At the Portland workshop, there were examples of books completed in previous workshops. I was most impressed by this one by Pamela Olson, a Navy veteran. It's about her rape in Puerto Rico in 1983 and its aftermath, which continues to this day. And I just want to go through a few pages here because I was just really impressed by this work. Next one, please. The book opens with this image of a path, always an evocative image to me, so full of the implication of hope, of the path ahead and all of that. And then you learn that this is where she was raped. There is a lot of art in this book. There, there are only a few photographic pictures in it. This is a photo book. Next one, please. The text is reproduced photographically from Pamela Olson's handwritten notes in which she goes over and over the rape. So instead of seeing a quote unquote clean finished version, like we saw going from the dummy to the clean version of the Avedon portraits, uh, we experience this process with Pamela Olson and gain an insight into her struggle to refine the voice that the rapist took away. The text is reproduced as page fragments because her memory is in fragments. So I say this is you know, a really smart, really sophisticated use of photographic reproduction and layout. So um, remembering uh, all of Elizabeth Avedon's comments about book dummies, in this instance, we might go so far as to say that the dummy is the book. And uh, I especially like this page. This is a spread from the book. It actually shows how she was working. It's a photograph of her text as she pinned it to foam core. And you get a real sense of the physicality, not just you know being able to see the um, texture of the foam core, but you can sense the power, you know, the anger in that ah, slashing arrow. Next one. And this is the back cover. Uh, it's an image of Pamela Olson working with her texts on that foam core board. Um, this is a reiteration on the book's emphasis on process. Next one. And if you follow the links from the Veterans Book Project homepage to purchase Pamela Olson's book, you come to this page in lulu.com. Now, lulu.com, I will just read their uh, self-definition. Lulu is an online self-publisher and digital marketplace that empowers creators to publish, sell, and profit from their work. With no upfront cost, individuals and organizations are fully enabled to set the price of their creations and the amount of creator revenue they want to earn. Furthermore, Lulu creators retain complete control over editorial content, copyright, and distribution. Translated into seven languages with 1.3 million registered members from over 80 countries, Lulu is changing the world of publishing. And all of the Veterans Book Project books are available on Lulu. And each one carries as a title the name of the person who actually made the book, like Pamela Olson, Riley Charbonneau. But Monica Haller is listed as the author. <laughs> I, I'm still not trying to get my head around that. <laughs> the next one, please. We were very lucky to have uh, B. Nettles, the photographer and book artist, spending uh, the month of February with us here in Portland. And I, I hope some of you went to her talk at the Art Museum. And knowing that I'm interested in Bee's work, Laura Russell introduced us. This, uh, of course, Bee Nettles has shown at 23 Sandy. And this is the page for her 2007 exhibition, Return Trips. Next one, please. Um, this is... This is Lulu.com's Bee Nettles storefront. And uh, Bee began self-publishing in the 1970s, producing limited edition books using a variety of printing and reproduction processes. Having mastered, among other methods, offset printing and desktop publishing, Bee is now using print-on-demand services from Lulu. Interestingly, next one, please. She is still tinkering with process, as in this second edition of her 1988 book, Corners, um, as she explains on her website. This is the second edition of Corners, a collaborative book of poetry by my mother using my images. The original book was issued in 1988, printed in duotones of black and burgundy. 
The book is in full color. This book is in full color featuring hand-tinted images and several never-before-published poems among the 75 included. As B notes, this book is in full color featuring hand-tinted images. It would have been too expensive for her to self-publish a full color book before print on demand. So not, you know, print on demand has not just altered how she can distribute her books, it's altered how she makes her books. So next one, please. To the important connection to Photo Lucida, which is gonna take over this town next month with its biennial portfolio review. Photo Lucida's mission is to increase the publication and op exhibition opportunities for emerging photographers. The big prize of the annual critical mass competition is its book award. And for that, the winner gets publication of a monograph. If he or she has not yet published a monograph, however, if he or she has published, self-published a book, that's okay. They're still eligible for this book award. <coughs> And so this year's winner is uh, Jeff Rich. Jeff Rich, and this is his uh, website. And uh, his, uh, they're going to publish a book of his series, Watershed, a survey of the French Broad River Basin. Next, please. Another book award is offered by the Kassel Photo Book Festival, which is now in its fourth year in Kassel, Germany. Um, they have what they call the Dummy Award, which I think is great. Uh, the idea is submit your unpublished photo book and win a complete photo book production. There's an educational aspect to this uh, Dummy Award competition. As it says on their website, a major criterion for the prize selection is the successful merging of excellent photographic work with the special design elements of the book medium. To prepare for our annual Dummy Award, we strongly recommend participation in one of the festival workshops that focus on the design and production of photo books. One of the goals of the Dummy Award is to raise the quality of the photographic book. We would be happy to hear your ideas and suggestions which might be helpful in this regard. Next one, please. Also offered at the Photo Book Festival in Kassel um, is a panel on collecting photographs with Martin Parr. Now, Martin Parr, uh, if you've ever read anything about him, he's, he's an interesting fellow. He collects everything, including famously Saddam Hussein uh, wristwatches. That's probably his most famous uh, collection. Um, he's probably collecting Gaddafi wristwatches right now. Perhaps. 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 He may have. Get off your hats. Get, get off your hats, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's all done tongue in cheek, but not really, because, uh, you know, it's a commentary on our consumer culture and it's kind of postmodern and so forth. And I'm not sure that I get everything about Martin Parr, but I'm, you know, I'm sure we all have plenty of time to keep trying. So with Jerry Badger, uh, Martin Parr published. Uh, so, so far two volumes of their The Photo Book, A History. And these two books have had a seismic impact on collecting photo books. So they're offering this panel, uh, which is described thusly, which I think sums up everything we might want to say in this forum, all the questions we might want to ask in this forum, uh, for which we may or may not have answers. Why are photo books being collected anyway? Is it passion, obsession, and investment? Does the book, as an up to now readily available quote unquote democratic medium, suffer as a result of an involvement in the art market? Or is it finally achieving its proper value? The constant appreciation of the photo book as an artistic medium goes hand in hand with a growing skepticism towards market developments. On the one hand, it can be observed that increasingly books are being published specifically for collectors. Prices for small editions are climbing with the dwindling of the edition, remainders of sought after sought after titles cost a multiple of the original price. Small, valuable subscription volumes are only available through pre-order at high cost. So this is getting into the whole notion of rarity value. On the other hand, digital printing methods have established a vibrant scene of self-published individual products. And independently of the contemporary market, canonized photo book classics are becoming more and more expensive. What is the meaning of this development? And what indeed? So, um, 
<laughs> I'm asking the same questions. <laughs> Next one, please. And back to the issue of raising the quality of the photo book. If you can't go to CASEL for one of their recommended workshops, here are some alternatives. This book is coming out very soon uh, from Princeton University Press by Darius Himes and Mary Virginia Swanson. I'm sure some of you have met them at workshops and uh, meetings and so forth. They do a lot of consulting about photo books, about publishing and design and, and marketing and so forth. And uh, it says in the publisher's blurb that we live in the golden age of the photography book. Um, it's, I would have to agree. Next one, please. Or you could uh, order this DVD in English, luckily, uh, How to Make a Book with Steidel, Gerhard Steidel. And he is, and his company is the German photo book publisher. Or, next one. You could have spent a couple of days late last year in Italy with Alex Soth. And uh, in his two-day workshop somewhere in rural, rural Italy, Alex Soth will discuss different approaches to conceiving and executing the production of a photographic book. Along with the issues of editing, sequencing, layout, and design, Soth will speak about the diverse distribution channels available to contemporary photographers. I think that probably pretty much <laughs> that would be a good course, and he looks like a fun guy. Or you could take, shout out for me, you could sign up for my Art of the Photo Book four-week course in June and July at the, in the Pacific Northwest College of Art Education, Canadian Education Department. It's online now. It's act, that's actually a hands-on class if anybody's interested. Next one. So we're, we're coming down to winding up our ball of yarn. And it happens that uh, back in late 2009, um, a blog called Resolve uh, initiated, and a, another uh, website called Flack Photo initiated a cross-blog discussion uh, about the future of the photo book. It's hard to deny that there are seismic shifts happening in the publishing industry right now between digital readers like the Kindle, print-on-demand publishers like Blurb, and the rumored Apple tablet computer. There are a lot of questions right now about exactly what a book will be in the future, especially photo books. And so this, these questions, or a series of questions, went out to all the pundits. And uh, they got responses from hundreds. And I started to sift through them. I came up with three that I thought were really uh, apropos and provide a, a good finish to this talk. So Alex Soth said, while most print media is dying, the photo book is going through a renaissance. I can only hope the vibrancy and appreciation of this medium will increase. Part of the photo book renaissance has to do with the increased ease of DIY printing and distribution. New technology will only offer more options, but I should be clear that this doesn't make publishers obsolete. Next one. And Darius Himes said, print on demand is a powerful new tool, but many photographers are still using it straight out of the box. I genuinely hope to see more creative innovation. And the next one. Elizabeth Avedon contributed, considering how fast technology is evolving, I think we can't begin to imagine the form photo books will take. 10 years is light years in technological time. I do think photography books in any form will still have a collectible market. And finally, Leslie Martin of the Aperture Foundation, the publisher of the Aperture Books. The conversation on photo books is reaching a point of super saturation. This newfound attention must be viewed conversely within the larger context of the implosion of the publishing industry at large. This is one of those moments of reconsideration that history loves to give us. The book is dead. Long live the book. And uh, that, I thought, was the end. Next. <laughs> but I made the mistake of looking at Alex Sos' Little Brown Mushroom blog one last time last night. And I found a reference to what's next? A search into the future of photography, a new survey, this time launched by FOAM, an Amsterdam-based photography organization. This is one of the questions in the survey. They want to know what comes after the golden age of photo books. So we're not allowed to even just enjoy it <laughs> while it's here. Next one. 
And so as a coda to my talk, um, reproducing here, part of Alex So's survey response, which is typically funny, he, he diagrammed. The medium is moving in two directions simultaneously. It is becoming both increasingly digital and physical. The obvious analogy is the music industry. Most people get their music via inexpensive digital downloads, but at the same time, vinyl album sales were up 33% last year. The diehards crave something physical. In the world of photographic publishing, 99% of trade publications will become digital. Most photo magazines, museum catalogs, and other photographic publications will be read on digital tablets. But then there will be the glorious 1% of handcrafted physical books. If I were in marketing, I might show you an illustration like this. So he has vinyl to, I guess that's supposed to be digital. Uh, and he has you know, mass market down here, limited edition up there, tactile to digital. And um, he f concludes, thank God I'm a photographer, not in marketing. <laughs> so with that, I um, say thank you for your kind attention. And I... <laughs> now do we jump up and, and put away the chairs or... <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, in all you've seen in the books over Blue Sky and your obvious study of this, um, have you seen the influence of Blurb and Lulu as changing the kind of design that's being done in photo books? Either, either something new and creative or something more template oriented? You know? um, I think I'd have to go with what Darius Hines said about a year and a half ago already is that it seems like people are using those templates out of the box. Um, and I can understand that, you know, there's, there's just, you've got to play with your new stuff be, to learn it to a certain extent. But uh, it's also because um, they offer only certain set formats. They've added to those formats, they've added a very small version now. But as Heim says in one of his blogs, why don't people just trim? You know, why don't they just, uh, or, you know, trim to a different size, have it done in one size, get it, trim it to another size, and have it hand bound so that you have something that isn't just right off the rack. In other words, to tailor it, I guess, would be, you know, t take ready to wear and tailor it. Um, and I think there'd probably be more of that as people become more comfortable, shall we say, with the, with the blurb. Um, so it's not so much one size fits all anymore. And you can also override all the templates. If you That's want. right. You can use your own blank <coughs> templates, or you can use your own PDFs. You can do it in InDesign and make it a PDF, and then put it into Blurb. Is that right, Jim? Yeah. yeah. Well, Virginia, I was wondering, as consulting librarian and curator to the Blue Sky Library, are you? Am I? I, I and scared. We better so. ask her. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you take on that role. Is the um, acquisition committee considering purchasing online books for its library? I, I doubt it very much. I don't think there's a budget for that. So, well, here's stems to another question. Can you foresee libraries and or museum libraries actually calling and curating what's available online of the artists that they collect and exhibit and downloading and adding those to their libraries? Or do you think they will stick with the traditionally published books? And you know, th that, <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, I would say that, you know, museum's mission is not only to hold but to display. Yeah. So I would expect that museums will still, become, will still be collecting physical objects. They might exist in two forms, in digital and physical, but they will, you know, the, the point of the museum is to have something to display. Right. Yeah. But they do have libraries, and libraries obviously yes, are, of course. you know, many are gravitating back to objects and away from digital can. Well, at the time uh, that I was at MoMA, they, of course, had just uh, acquired the Frank Franklin Furnace Artist Books Archive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think MoMA, the, that's probably a special case because there the library is a curatorial department of a kind itself. Um, Reed College, the artist book collection, is part of the library. And as far as I know, they're, 
I don't know what could you say, Laura. I I don't know of any. I don't know Is that the collection at all. Looking at online self-published books for their collection. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because I, I deal only in, in artist books. I haven't really talked at all with anyone about print on demand books and whether or not. Well, it'd be interesting to ask Stephanie Snyder if and the librarian if they are consulting with each other about adding to the acquisition of artists they've exhibited to have that archive and reference. We should be. Yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. I think it does. Yeah. Yes? And considering why we're living in the golden age of photo books, I guess we're not living in the golden age of much. So it's nice that we are doing that. I was a little surprised that you didn't mention the influence of Portland's own Nasrali Press, producing arguably some of the mm -hmm. finest uh, commercial photo books on the face of the earth. They're printed in China. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you mentioned. Um, there are many, many other presses I could have mentioned, but uh, I actually should have titled this uh, talk Photo Books Online, um, but uh, Laura convinced me that it should be the state of photo books. So it's not really meant to be a survey of the whole scene, but just hitting like the hot topics. But thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, the online books are conditioning us to accepting a, um, a lower quality image, photographic image, as compared to what could be done with, say, stochastic printing and offset printing? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I would say, uh, for instance, in exhibition committee meetings, whenever we look at a book as a, you know, it's kind of as a, first run through of the person's work and uh, whenever we look at some digital images, you know, it's, um, there's always questions about print quality that come up. Um, again, it's all about the purpose is going to be exhibition. Yes. And so unless it's understood, that, you know, somehow the, the prints as vintage prints are perhaps damaged or, or, or perhaps part of the person, the photographer's aesthetic is a damaged print or a fuzzy stained print or something, then we're always going to be looking, I think, for fine exhibition quality prints. I'm, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it does. My, my personal uh, survey, which is based strictly on you know, visual data, looking at blur books versus looking at something that might have been printed by like Artron in China, uh, the, uh, the online books, there's not a whole lot in terms of quality of the image. There's just not the depth there and the, and the sharpness and so forth. And so I, I, I'd say I'm wondering if we're not getting conditioned to accepting. And it, it does depend a lot on the content of the book, the purpose of the book, and so forth. I mean, it's not strictly a, a book of photographic images to be enjoyed for the photographic images. If it's got a larger context with, with content and a topical theme, of, you know, then that's a whole different ball of wax, but if you're just looking at fine, you know, one of the, the finest photographs you can get printed, uh, my personal experience is that you can still get a better image through good quality uh, offset printing, or even better if you can do a handout book where you can get um, photographic paper that has emulsion on both sides, you can actually print, you know, basically a fine, fine art print and have them bound together and you've got a portfolio of original photographs that, again, just smokes on them you can do well, online. Well, these are considerations, issues that have been driving photographic publishing for 150 years. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is the best printing process or reproduction process that will deliver the goods? What is the best that we can do? What, so for instance, I published a book with Aperture, not in my own photographs, but Victorian photographs by Clementine the Lady Haywarden. And uh, that book was 15 years in the making, not at Aperture, but just me going to different publishers and explaining 
what the purpose of this book would be. And also, of course, Mark Hayworth Booth at the Victorian Albert Museum backing me up and saying it has to be beautifully reproduced, it has to be beautifully reproduced. And finally, it all came together with Aperture, was willing to take the time and get the, um, get the separations done properly, and print it in duotone and so forth. And I'm glad we held out for that. But it, there are other books about Lady H that were published you know, by, ac by academic presses that have really poor reproductions. Right. So it's always going to drive the production. Yeah, so I was just, just wondering if, there, if there, you had a general sense of whether, it sounds like you believe that the, uh, the online books are reaching a quality that is close enough. It, to me, certainly. To me, certainly. Um, I know that uh, there's a program, uh, there's a young woman who works at Blue Sky, also works at Photo Lucida, Trisha Hoffman, and she's in a program at the University of Hartford. Um, for an MFA in photography, and it's uh, as one of their, uh, I don't know, sections, they're doing pretty intensive work on photographic books. And I asked her, well, you're going to do these in Blur, <coughs> Lulu, or something. She says, no, that's not good enough quality. They're actually going to go to an offset printer and have their books done. And it's a huge thing for students to do, I think. And I would say, for my class <laughs> at PNCA in the Continuing Education Department, I, I would think that blurb is going to be just fine. Yes? And I, I'd also say that you know, there's a place for everything. You know, we listen to digital music that on our iPods that's missing a whole lot of information, but that's what we're listening to, that's what we're buying. We rarely... You know, yes. Go to the extent of hearing live music or some of those intermediate yep. steps, and so you know there, there is a place. And with you know yep. content-driven imagery, sometimes we're not as critical about the, the, the luscious, beautiful depth that a, a you know, silver gel imprint might have. Or and they don't even have the luscious, beautiful depths that they used to have, yeah, do yeah, they? Yeah, they don't yeah, put enough yeah. silver in them anymore. So, so not according yeah. to us old guys. Yeah, yeah. But let me tell you. Um, my ex-husband uh, was a, an opera buff, and he worked with an old lady, this is in the 80s, so she would have been born about 1890, uh, who was an opera buff. And to her, the only really good uh, quality sound of opera recordings came from this sort of contraption, you know, this Rube Goldberg contraption of like a horn that curved like this, like you know, all around the room, and you sort of sat right there. <laughs> and that was the perfect, uh, reproduction with the most fidelity, the human voice that she could possibly think of. She would, you know, this digital stuff, yuck, you know, no, no form to it, no, no uh, physical sound to it. So I, I, mm, I don't want to say I'm not that fussy because I am incredibly fussy, but. <laughs> Uh, you trade that off for access, though, to people. Yes, who absolutely. Have, have, have absolutely. Them. And you know. And I'm really interested gateway. in access. I am not interested. I'm. I'm really interested in opening up the whole field of endeavor. I'm not interested in participating in something that's not going to be popular. I think the fact that everybody's here shows that it is very popular, and I'm very, very happy about that. Okay. That's a good idea. Thank you all.